I was standing by my window yesterday morning. Hi, I'd like to welcome everyone to the February 2nd meeting of the Collectors Club. We have an incredible program ready for you this evening, given by one of our own, John Armour. And I know everyone is really looking forward to that. And to do the honors in introducing her of someone very special, and that is Keith Harmer. So Keith. Thanks a lot, Larry. It is an honor to introduce my wife. Well, about 20 years ago, a very innocent and attractive girl by the name of Joan entered into the world of philately by marrying me. After a couple of years, she approached me and said the most fearful words I could imagine. As I am a harmer, I think I should start collecting stamps. Well, I tried to escape from the situation by sending her in a direction in which she would fail. Japanese stampless covers. It's a great collecting area. Even when she mentioned it to my father, Bernard Harmer, who was alive at the time, obviously, at the age of 90, Bernard said, there weren't any. And that's true unless your name was Perry. Nevertheless, she found one, but that was about it. She then graduated to what is now a work in progress, the Nova Scotia stampless covers that proved to be quite exceptional to this point, but still a work in progress. To keep busy, Joan was inspired by Darth Vader, who introduced my web talk back in August of 2020 on forged co covers, the dark side of philately, and therefore chose morning covers. And here we are. I give you Dr. Joan Marie Welsh Harmer. Well, thank you, Keith. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending. So the song that played as you were all entering was, is called Letters Edged in Black. And it's by Haiti, Nevada. And it was written in 1897. It was sort of appropriate for this talk. That rendition was played by Jim Reeves. So I just wanted to give you a bit of a warning that uh, this talk is about morning covers and morning covers are a byproduct of death. Just be aware and consider this like the notice that you get when you do a search and you come up with Third Reich materials. You know, some of these things may, may not be to your liking. What we're going to talk about today is morning covers. And there's a lot of different directions that you could go with morning covers. My background is liberal arts. So I liked postal history and the stories. I was attracted to morning covers as a way to focus my Nova Scotia stampless collection because I really didn't have, have a direction for that. And I was already familiar with culture and rituals. So morning covers made sense to me. So someone suggested that I play with them first and try to understand how they worked. So let's go into the definition of morning cover. And Ernest Mosher was really the guru of all this. He wrote a big textbook. It's a very comprehensive textbook on the topic. And what he said was that morning covers are black edge post letters used in many countries in the 19th and 20th century. And they're harbingers of death and messengers of grief. I really, really love that definition. I would challenge him though, and say that not all of the morning covers I've seen were, were actually edged in black. And, and I would also say that a lot of them didn't go through the post. So they were hand carried and, and the like. So I would really broaden that definition of, of morning cover. They come in many, many different forms from envelopes, folded letters, wrappers, postcards, postal cards, which um, one is issued by the government has postage. The challenge being that when you look at envelopes and folded letters and wrappers, they do not have content. So to, to really definitively say that this artifact was used for mourning is, is a little difficult. A lot of it is sort of taken, taken on faith that it is a mourning cover. These are the examples. 
blown up. The first use of mourning covers is really, I couldn't find an exact date. Some say it was in the 1600s, but I did not see an example. Moser said that it was 1767. And my, my first one in this, uh, in this example, in this, what I have in my exhibit, it's not really exhibit, my collection is 1765. And that doesn't have a border, it's, it's a death notice, but I would consider it more of a, a mourning cover. So these mourning covers really exploded when postal reform and the penny post came about and Catherine Golden did a really great presentation on the social impact of the postal post, uh, the post office reforms on society. And I think this is one of the reasons why you see a lot of different, um, a lot more mourning covers. So this is a chart from Ernest Moshe's book where he, he basically did a census and tried to figure out where exactly most of the morning covers are coming from. Most of them are centered around the late uh, 1800s, corresponding with the, the Victorian era, and they taper off toward the end. I would uh, disagree a little bit. Most of the ones I've seen are more from around the war, the 1930s, 1940s. Just a, a little difference in what... Uh, in the population and what you have. The stamps that I have, basically I've, I've purchased them before I was, you know, before I started doing some of the Nova Scotia. And I had the opportunity of get, uh, purchasing uh, some of Guy Dillaway's collection. And then we had uh, access to his entire Britannia stock. And that had hundreds and hundreds of warning covers. So I was able to do a really, good analysis on those different, uh, different morning covers. So let's put this timeline into perspective. Here's where uh, Queen Victoria was born, uh, she became queen. And then this is where Prince Albert died. And as you know, her, she went into very, very deep mourning over him. So this, this is really where the morning covers pick up their use. There's something that they call morning stamps. These are stamps that are issued usually by a president or a celebrity within 12 months of their death. And uh, this is the Lincoln one is considered uh, by him to be a mourning stamp. We're gonna go into the causes of death because this is really what starts the mourning. And my approach to this is a little different. I wanted to look at the Victorian era in particular because that's when most of these covers started. And look at the role that mourning covers played in the death ritual and how the Victorians handled death. So in the 17 and 1800s, there were many different causes of death, mostly diseases. And this could be a talk in and among itself. I actually happen to have a lot of, a little macabre here, but I have a lot of letters that deal with different causes of death and di different disasters. I, I was thinking at one time of putting uh, something together for all the disasters in New York or in, in Brooklyn, but I didn't uh, quite get to that. So one of the biggest causes of death back in the Victorian era was scarlet fever. And that was, it was pretty, pretty deadly, very, took a lot of people. This artifact happened to be a morning cover that talks about the scarlet fever that took possession of this, the writer's sister's house. And she lost two children and about eight, uh, eight people. Smallpox was, it's another cause of death that really spans throughout the centuries. And the World Health Organization said it was eradicated in 18, uh, 1980, but it did come back. This took more people in the 17th and 18th centuries than uh, probably any other disease that, uh, that I know of. About 13% of each generation perished, and we all know what it did to the American Indians. There was an interesting side note, and to bring it more contemporary, when smallpox vaccines first came out, they were made uh, compulsory back in England at, by the Act of 1853. So a bunch of these anti-vaxxers said, all right, we're going to get around this vaccination by not registering the, the birth of our children. 
So then in 1875, they started making birth registrations com compensatory. This letter here on the right was about a smallpox outbreak in 1846 in Indiana, and it's a steamboat letter. And the person just really couldn't wait to get out of the area. So in addition to the, the death and the, uh, from the battles and stuff, the smallpox came and she said, having the opportunity will sell and just, just get out of here. So this other, another big cause of death, and it's a little taboo to talk about, and it still is with us all the way up into the modern era, is syphilis. You know, Al Capone was a famous syphilis sufferer. But smallpox, uh, called the French pox, really did a number. They didn't have the treatment back then. I like this cover, Stamp Out Syphilis, syphilis in Saskatchewan. Sort of float, I thought, of Henry Sawyer there. Not really a morning cover, but it was sent to a Mr. Greaves. So tuberculosis is another cause of death that was pretty big. And some of the famous sufferers there were uh, Doc Holliday. And to the right is just a contemporary uh, seal, Christmas seal. And I thought of um, the, Christmas, uh, the Christmas seal talk that we had with Mr. Beale. There were actually accidents and wrecks. Now, this is another area. Keith collects disaster ships. So the only two accidents uh, I put into this are shipwrecks. There are many more that I have, but this seemed appropriate. This is the shipwreck of the Birkenhead and it sank in 1852 and lost 545 men. This is a letter that uh, went on that. And then of course, no one could forget the Titanic. And these are actually morning postcards. And as an artifact, so a lot of times, you know, people embody mourning and grief on objects. The Titanic happened to be one of them. And these are real. You could find these a lot. Some of them are real, some of them are fake, but uh, we have a lot of these in the collection. So in addition to that, you have war, you have uh, war and you have crimes. And we're gonna just really focus on, on uh, mourning covers. So as you can see in the 1900s, the, a lot of diseases here and the death rate was a lot higher. Modern times, uh, not so much lower death rate. So this really sets the stage of what I wanted to show is the, the role of these mourning covers in the Victorian era. So mourning is a cultural response. It's a way for us to feel connected to other people. It, the rituals and what we do have to do with our culture. They have to do a bit with the time. They have to do with, uh, with your religion. So not, um, not all people will respond, but we are going to focus on the Victorian era and how they, and how they responded. So in the Victorian era, death was something that was, they weren't really afraid of. Everyone was interested in having a good death, making their final words be ones that are remembered throughout history. And it was also a part of your social standing on how well you handled the, the death of a loved one and of your family. There's a lot of etiquette that surrounded it. And this is where a lot of these morning covers came from. But there's two parts of this ritual where mourning covers come into play. One's with the grieving, the, the people who have lost the person, and then for the friends and associates. So these mourning covers are black edged letters could come from either way. And there's a, a bunch of different sources back in the Victorian era. So they come from the deceased family to the deceased family. And we're also gonna talk about public mourning and that is a little bit, that is where someone uh, of stature or president or someone significant died. And this is a lovely little Cape Town cover, 1884. And I just, I thought it was pretty. I like a lot of the Cape covers. You'll see them scattered throughout this presentation. So once someone passes, usually in the house, we'll say in the house, the first thing you do is stop the clocks. And there, that served a very practical purpose, which was to record the time of death. But it, there was also a superstition to that to make sure that, that the person wasn't going anywhere. 
You then cover the mirrors, and that was to prevent the spirit of the deceased from being trapped. Uh, it was also known to be some vanity because you really don't look good when you're crying and, and teary-eyed. So I guess this was a way to make you feel better. There is also, you, know, you also close the drapes and make the house really dark. Then the next thing you do, and this is really what signaled mourning to the whole community, is you put a dark uh, a black wreath outside your door. And you'd also tie a black cloth, a piece of crepe usually, around the knocker so that way it would not disturb the people inside. It would be really muffled. It was black for an adult, white for a child. And this is real where mourning really begins. Now, callers who were coming to the house would leave calling cards. These are normally what they would do in Victorian era, but these calling cards tended, tended to have the, this black outline. And a lot of people would consider these mourning covers. So there should be no message in these, in these uh, calling cards because to do so would be to upset the grieving family. They had enough to do than to worry about what you wrote and feel that they had to respond. So these are really small cards. They're like four inches by two, point, two and a half inches. They look remarkably similar to the, the cards that would be sent, you'll see later on, acknowledging the thank yous and acknowledging the death back in, uh, in South America. So without the contents, I think it's a little hard to tell which is which, but this one happened to come on good, good authority that it was a calling card. The next step you do take is to call the funeral director or the undertaker. In the early part of the century, it was the undertaker. He was the gatherer. He would get you everything you need. He was oftentimes uh, had other, another occupation. He was a cabinet maker or some other profession. By the later part of the century, the undertaker became more of a profession. And they were, you had funeral directors. They would change their title to funeral directors. And they really took on stewarding the family throughout the whole, whole process. So now I want to give you a couple examples of some undertakers invoices, and these are in today's dollars. So this form from 1886 would, would cost $60,000 today. Of course, they had a silver, a silver uh, little tag in the casket, so that way you could see who it is. So that was quite elaborate. In Kenny Buckport, 1901, this one would be, to, in today's dollars, it was $134. Then it was about $4,000 in today's, today's dollars. Embalming, you'll see a lot of these embalming cards, and these tend to be very popular. So if you weren't going to embalm, because that didn't really come out until 1890, the woman of the house or close friend would go and prepare the body. She, you know, she'd wash everything, make sure everyone's clean and dressed. When embalming became fashionable, the embalmer would either come out to the house and do it there in the kitchen, or he would take the, take the deceased back to his facilities and do it there. Embalming wasn't regulated, so the funeral, the fluid itself, the chemical make makeup could be a variety of things and produce some really interesting results with your deceased family. But you'll see a lot of these embalming uh, advertising cards. So then you'll prepare the body. We're going to skip over that because it is dinner here in New England. So it just we, we all know what, what they do. The next order is it really is for the women, they would go and order their morning dress. Now it was in poor form to wear the same morning dress to, the, to different funerals. So you'd always have to get yourself a new morning dress. Back in, in the late, mid to late 1800s, stores like Lord and & Taylor and most, most department stores had morning departments, which sold everything from parasols to hats to, Underclothing, all designed to, for the woman of, of stature to express her, her grievance. The dresses were saturated in arsenic at times to make them stiff, which also produced some interesting results. So there's, there's a big retail industry for morning clothes. This Jays was one of, probably one of the biggest in England, and they had a big mail order business. And 
I was surprised when I looked through this that there was not a lot, a lot more of these artifacts, these catalogs left um, at least available on market. So for the poorer people, they might want to rent a suit because clothing was very expensive. So they would rent the final, you know, the final outfit. Men wore arm, black armbands that started in England in about 1770. Men and children wore them for, for quite a long time, it was not intrusive. The interesting thing was when Prince Albert died, Queen Victoria ordered all her servants to wear the black armband for at least eight years. I'm not sure OSHA today would agree with, with that rule, but yeah, it was Queen Victoria. So now a woman would go and purchase morning stationery. And this is, again, part of the morning covers. You'll see here, you could buy different sizes of, of the band. Now, there's a lot of myths over what size, if a size means something. I have not seen in my, in my analysis where the size of the band was a reflection of the, the relationship between the sender or the deep mourning. Now, whether it was a, whether you were in the first morning or moved toward the, the later part of, of morning. Some say that the ban would just decrease. I, I have found no evidence of it. I don't, I don't think most of you did either, but don't hold me to that. So the papers, lots of different papers. And you know we have Nancy Poley and there's a, a fellow, Mr. Walker, who Dan Walker, who attends these frequently, who will probably tell you more about this paper than you ever wanted to know. But this, there's a variety of stationaries and it was sold at most, most stores usually in packs of 25. The next thing that the, the grieving family would do would be acknowledge those cards. And this is from 1866. It was a hand-delivered thank you note. It also included a notice of when a viewing could occur. But this one was likely hand-delivered and it contained this really nice little needlepoint gift for the recipient. Death notices were, were sent out. Now, this is, this is one from 1765. This is my earliest piece and sent via the Penny Post. Basically, uh, Moser said that it was a printed card. This is handwritten. I would consider a death notice to just be a notification of death and not to have an in invitation to a viewing or a funeral. Just, you know, Joe died and... Here it is. So these death notices, some of them were personal. And this is an example where it was direct, directed direct, uh, specifically at a person. And he just, it was written a little late. It was about four months after the person died, but it just says, dear, dear auntie, or, you know, my, my father died. And the tan graph paper I thought was really, really neat with this. Some of them were semi-personal, and I pictured the husband writing about 30 of these sitting at a desk and just writing them out to say, dear friends, you know, my wife had died. I loved her very much, it's sort of as if you were a teacher, you know, a teacher sent you to write on the blackboard. But this one was sent to the United States from Great Britain with postage due. Now, postage due is, is a little rare with morning covers, but uh, it happened. This one was printed. This one was from 1875, again, from Great Britain to the United States. This one was supplied by an undertaker, more than likely. And it was the two and a half pence per half ounce rate. And it was postage to 10 cents, uh, 10, postage to 10, which in US currency was eight cents, four cents deficiency and four, four cents penalty. This was a probably sent to a business. It was printed, printed up there. And what was interesting about this is inside was a little hand written, written notice. And this was printed in 1799. And it was probably hand here. So this was an interesting thing. This is a uh, printed matter. It was just probably a business just saying, uh, I can't, I didn't translate it, but probably saying this person died 
this death notice was really interesting because we actually had the obituary on this. And this was 1860 from Liverpool, England, that the deceased happened to live in Portland, in New Orleans, and this came via Portland, Maine. The fellow was involved in the insurance industry and perished in a fire. And this is, you have the newspaper clipping about his death, and then you had the, the actual notice that came to a family down in New Orleans. Commercial death notices, a lot of those, uh, these are from just a, a few of them. I saw Cuba, thought of the meal, and just had to throw those out. But these are, these are printed and this is, there's a lot of these types of notices. Now, to come to a funeral, you had to have, you should have an invitation. It was very poor form to actually come to a funeral or an interment or a wake without an invitation. These are two examples. The first is 1895, Lebanon, Kentucky, nice printed one. And then a fill in the blank one from 19, I think it's 35, uh, 1935, yes. So they usually were hand carried and later um, really used the mail. This one, it, it was classified in what I had as an invitation. I'm not sure in Europe, it was very popular to write the name of all the relatives on the card. This was fairly big, eight and a half inches, by eight and a quarter inches by five and a quarter inches. I would consider these more of a broad uh, broadside, but from France, you'll notice from France and a lot of the European countries, they have these very, very thick borders. Next, you just would move, the family would move the, uh, the deceased into the parlor for the viewing. And these are, I love these little advertising covers so you could get these. And they have all different aspects of the, the uh, ritual, the death ritual are on these, on these uh, advertising covers. I thought that was really great. Caskets were sometimes hard to get out of the house because not everyone had doors that wide back in, in the Victorian era. Some of the wealthier people actually had special doors made to, to do this type of thing, especially with an ancestral house. So a lot of times these wakes or these, uh, these viewings were done outside because that was the only place that they could really fit in. So now the, the other strange thing that they, they would do, or I, it's strange now, it wasn't strange then, was to have these post-mortem photos. This would probably be the only time that you would get your photo taken. Um, too bad no one could see it, but they would pose the family sometimes with the entire family. Sometimes they'd take pictures of the child alone, but it was not uncommon to just have the whole family. So this one was very late, 1948, and it was, from the Czech Republic to New York. And this other one is uh, 1903, I believe around 1903, and it's a gypsy camp. Other interesting things that they would do is they would have a vial to collect the tears of mourning, tears of sorrow. They would take the deceased hair and make it into these loud, lavish shadow boxes and elaborate gifts. And some of them would do wreaths with multiple family members. And another strange thing, you know, another thing they would do is have these wax dolls made, particularly of infants. Sometimes they would leave them at, at the funeral, sometimes they would bring them back, but that they would have them crafted to look like the, uh, the departed child. So then you would have the wake and the viewing. So after someone died, it was very custom to stay three days, have the family stay three days, 24 seven around the body. Premature death was a, a big concern back then. So they wanted to make sure that the person was actually dead and not in a coma. So you sit there and look for any sign of life. And then after you're really convinced, the family would then go ahead and have this public viewing. They would choose some pallbearers. And sometimes they would hire these uh, mutes or professional mourners. The, again, the, the interment and viewing was really by invitation only. Now, at this point, you're free to send, outsiders are free to send their sympathy cards. And this is where what we tend to think of as traditional mourning covers or mourning uh, 
expressions of mourning are these sympathy notes. So these are uh, these are a few examples. The first, I, I just liked the stationery. I thought it was you know, very, very pretty stationery. It was about the death of a child. And the two were written about 10 years apart, but the stationery to me looks identical. I'm sure Nancy and Dan would pick that apart. Ch children's death was very frequent. So if you remember, whooping cough was one of the leading cause of death. That was a, you know, that was a definite death sentence for most, most children. And here is an example with a very lovely cloverleaf uh, rosette. I, it's not really tied, but uh, we'll just assume it was on the cover. This was from a son and daughter-in-law just telling about the death of their, it says one child, but I'm sure both of them died. Children's funerals were usually done with uh, everything in white, white coffins and white cloth on the door. The children often, other children used to serve as pole bearers. The next step would be to actually bring the person to the interment. This was usually an all male ordeal because women were a bit too delicate to see this part of the ceremony. You'd bring the deceased out of the, the house so that they would not be able to look back so they come out feet first. And then you just follow the, the uh, coffin to the, the cemetery and bury them. Uh, this is an example from Italy and I guess they wanted the fellow to have one last look around. So at the interment, you, normally what happened with the coffin would be opened just to again, make sure they were really afraid of premature death, like I said. And the other thing they were really afraid of are the resurrection men. And those were basically doctors who wanted to steal the corpse. So sometimes elaborate methods were, were taken to keep, make sure the, the deceased would stay in the ground. So at the end, they would, most of the people there would throw a little bit of dirt on the, on the coffin. Funeral meals. So probably in the 1600s, before Victorian era, but it was a little creepy, so I figured I'd share it. They would make things called corpse cakes. And this was dough that was left to raise on the deceased body. It was supposed to absorb all the good qualities of the dearly departed. These were this bread was baked and shared to the mourners, everyone who came. Later on, you had these sin eaters. Sin eaters were, they would put some bread, usually in a, in a plate, and they would hire someone not too, too reputable to come and eat that and eat away the sins, and then they would go and beat them. I sort of like the funeral cakes idea a little better. Those are just biscuits and some similar to what you serve today. Now, prior to World War I, you would typically have the feast about four days after the burial, and now it's really immediately following the interment. They would send out after the funeral these very elaborate uh, cabinet, they would be cabinet cards there at the funeral, but they would also send out these very lovely cut paper mementos. You were expected to keep this card probably in your Bible, and it would uh, they would send out sometimes needlepoint craftwork or a lock of hair of the deceased. Here's a few more examples of these cards. This one's 1869 Wales, and then 1913 printed cards, and then Argentina, just to show that this was not uh, something a custom that was just uh, Western. These broadsides were also used, and you'll see these a lot of these in um, in when you collect mourning covers. Broadsheet. These are sheets of paper printed on one side, and they're usually used for announcements. Probably put on a church bulletin board or a community bulletin board. And these are just two examples: um, one with a very thin border from Hungary, and then this the other one from the United States. The France ones again really have a lot of thick borders. And here's just a little, you know, a little taste of what they would look like from Finland all the way to, to um, Egypt and Bosnia. Okay, after everything was done, the family would send a thank you note. And as I mentioned before, the, from Uruguay in 1936, this thank you note looks pretty similar to the 
the calling cards that we saw earlier. This one just said the bereaved of. Now, don't hold me to that translation that was done by someone else, but so I assumed this was a thank you note. And then this lovely ladies cover that was from Greece. And again, there are no contents. So we just have to assume that it is in fact a mourning cover. Right after the death, women had this deep mourning, which lasted a year and a day. They were expected to wear, wear really dark clothes and somber. After a year after that, they could go into half mourning, which you lightened up the clothes. And then after that year passed, you know, so the second year, you could either end your mourning or do what Queen Victoria did, which is mourn for the rest of your life. Men just wore a hat and armband, double standard there. He's expected to remarry to take it so that someone is available to take care of the children. And he usually returned to work about a month after. So morning stationary, it, this is why it makes very hard to say if it was really morning. Morning stationary was used for correspondence for a time. So it could just be business correspondence. So you could get, if you do have the contents and it does have a black edge, it, it may not even relate to mention a death of somebody. So we're gonna briefly go through the physical characteristics. Most of them are white or it's a white variant. There are different colors, but uh, white is or cream is what I see the most of. Moshe went into a bunch of different types. I don't have them all represented. This is the black band one that we traditionally associate with the morning cover. Then you have ones that are black on the back only. They just have the, the little black border. This one is 1850, Cape of Good Hope to England. So just, just a black line, and that's considered a morning cover. This is another one. And the reason why I, I show this, not only did Keith give this to me, but I, I really question if this is a morning cover because of that, that little illustration on the front. But this is a, just a, a lovely little piece. This was similar. This came from Belgium in 1856. It has a paper cutout similar to Mosier's type three, the Can, uh, Canadian black lace. But the, there are some laced ones, some really nice ones. The wavy edge, this one was 1866, delivered locally. And then you have the cross hatch. I thought I'd get this one, but I didn't win this one. But these are, these are also very pretty. So this is just a cross hatch design, also considered a morning cover. Some people thought that the black edges were in poor taste, so they would, they would do different varieties. This is popular, this corner, black corner was very popular in South American countries. This was also a symbol of mourning. You know, I didn't really know this until I started collecting morning covers which is why I had to put this one up on the emails that you all received. It was to, I thought of Ed Grabowski. And when I saw Victor Segno, it's like, okay, I guess the good vibrations are not getting to this guy. So I thought that was pretty ironic. So you have these sort of arrow type designs that were made. These were also morning covers and they, they could be at any, any point in, in the timeline. So there was really no shift where one type was popular and the other was not. This one's from Greece and it came back to Greece. It went to Westfield. I thought of the Westfield stamp people and like, is there, why couldn't they find it? Is there any other Westfield? But they couldn't. This one doesn't have the black all the way to the corner edge, it just has a black band. Another black band, this one's censored. It has the Spanish tax stamps being paid. I, I didn't know you could use tax stamps to pay postage, but I guess you did. Next, you have the corner angles. And this was from Greece to New Haven. And this one is from Albania. The prior person said Albania wasn't listed as a, as a mourning country, but um, I, I can't stand by that. The next are inset markings that, that could occur. And then finally, I wanted to show, that's the last I have of the different types. There are more types, so I'm not going to show them. Handmade covers are really rare and they're really fun. So this one is from Mexico. 
and it was from a yarn manufacturer, so it's really quite well done. And these are from Italy and some from France. So I'm really just not going, I'm not going to show you the whole rates. I just want to show you the examples of the different types of morning covers. These are also handmade. This is really interesting from Grand Central Station in 1916. This went to, to Germany. They drew those corner cards. And this one just did the whole, uh, a whole little crosshatch there, similar to the one we saw printed earlier. This one is really interesting. It has the death, uh, someone hand drew the death symbol. And it's from 1814 to just indicate to the person that, hey, there's bad news inside. This one I thought was, again, really interesting. It's a telegraph. So the telegraph receiver, knowing that it was a death, decided to decorate the envelope. And the inside said, Will died yesterday, meet George at Bath. So this was a hand-drawn telegraph envelope that was converted to a morning cover. So we'll go briefly through official morning covers. This one was Garfield died. I don't have any from his wife. She was, she sent out a lot of morning covers, but this one I thought was interesting because it had the Garfield stamp on it and it uh, went to, to Mexico. And, uh, and Andy Cooper, I found that on Andy Cooper Smith's site. I just thought it was pretty ironic. So I wanted it. McKinley, again, uh, one of my favorite people. His wife sent the condolence card in the center. And then you have basically covers with, with McKinley on it, the postcards that would be sent out just to commemorate his death. The example, the really beaten up example on the right was again, I thought ironic because it notified people of the death of a child. And you had McKinley in the, in the right hand corner of that. And it, you know, it tells about how they, a little poem about burying her in a snow white casket, but uh, they didn't bury the sister so dear. And she still lives with us. I thought that was a very lovely poem. The White House would go ahead and put out, and I guess Buckingham Palace, I, I can't speak too much to that, but they use mourning stationery or black edge stationery to commemorate a death, though, as you can see in this one from the Secretary of the Interior, it this content had nothing to do with Harding's death or any death whatsoever, it's just someone wanting a favor. And then this is on the right, you just have a, a uh, free frank, presidential wife free franks are listed and Moshe listed a whole bunch of them and did a bit of a census. And she's just thanking people for sending her condolences. I think that might be printed. So now, um, briefly, we're going to go on a worldwide tour. Now, this is going to move really fast. It's a soup song of some morning covers. And we're looking for themes and variety, not so much all the postage. These are some of my favorite things. This is from Scotland, and I wanted to pose it exactly the way the seller advertised it, because I just loved the way it presented itself as a, a stampless cover. And then not to leave our friends in the UK out, we have a Free Frank morning cover from England. It's a little beat up, but. And for all our friends in the Carry On Local Society, we have morning covers that are sent by the Boyd City Dispatch, Bloods, and local delivery. So morning covers come all different ways. Some come by the streetcar, as this 1907 example shows. And more from the railroad. This one actually went to the Washington, to Washington Territory because Washington did not become a state until 1889. So this was a morning cover that was sent by a railroad with the railroad marking on the back, as you can see. This one again went to Canadian Rail. I just loved the shades there. And I thought of many of our Canadian friends when I saw that. But the, the shades were very pretty. It went to, this one went to Scotland. This one went by pneumatic tube. I actually haven't studied these pneumatic tube nails uh, that much, but I thought that was really cool that uh, morning cover went by tube. 
This one, I uh, thought it seemed Steve Zorinsky. This one's from America Samoa. This was, again, I thought it was fascinating because it had the Fuji stamp, but it, Fuji stamps were demonetized. So they gave it that uh, flag cancel and applied that two cent, the fourth bureau, a two cent and did a roller uh, roller cancel on that. But that was from, from uh, Samoa. And then from, you know, I, I thought of, Keith Klugman and, and Stephen Brown about these two, one from Natal and the other from New South Wales. The Natal one I thought was beautiful. I just, I just love the combination colors. And there, there's a little seal. So it was common to put black seals on, on the back of them. And then we have special delivery seals. These probably had funeral invitations or wake invitations because it seems silly to notify someone of a death by special delivery, but they come this way. I love this registered cover with, for all the seals on the back of it. There's 16 of them of the half penny, the 1866. So it paid the three cent postage plus the five cent registration. And it had the city's seal on the back of it. So I, I'm not convinced this is a morning cover, but you know, whatever, we will go with it. This one goes uh, to Japan from Scotland to Tokyo. And that's the way they spell Tokyo. I, I, that wasn't me. There's a, this was underpaid and I just love the way they put the, the paper on the Japanese. As Keith told you, um, I once collected Japanese stampless covers. And he once bought me one and sold it all in the same day. Postage dues, these are you know, sort of rare, rarer when you come look at morning covers. A lot of times the postmasters or the postal clerk would take pity on the deceased and not charge. This is one from the United States to England, postage due, but no postage charge from Great Britain to the United States, no postage charge. And then from France to Switzerland, but they went ahead and charged. Civil War for Dan Ryderman and all the Civil War people. This one is, again, this is where I brought in the definition of mourning covers. This was sent to a person who was in the hospital, but the surgeon, uh, assistant surgeon grabbed it because he was, uh, he was no longer with us there at the hospital and returned it. And of course, for that news, you had the privilege of paying three cents for the postage due on the return. Confederate morning covers that we'll just really talk about the one on the right briefly. That's 1862 from the Union occupation of, of New Bern, I guess, New Hampshire. And this was hand-drawn, sent without postage. So there was a six, six cents due on it. This one um, was from South Africa. And anything South Africa, Eddie Bridges comes to mind. This one, I'm gonna need like two or three bottles of wine to go through and try to figure out, but very busy cover and you know, really worth some study, but not now. A lot of these were censored. So you have a bunch of censored stuff. And then you have the Indochina, uh, these French Indochina, the, the uh, French male FM. I always think of Frank Mandel. World War I, World War II, we have our buddies and I, I went through all my Hitler stamps afterwards to see which ones were fake. And then this one is from South Africa and this is the Boer campaign. This is a really significant cover because it's the earliest known cover from this correspondence. So I didn't do the research, but they said a bunch of different history, which is really, really fascinating why I like morning covers. Moving on, just really quickly, bandwidth, two from this exact same date, different size bands. A lot of myths around whether the size of the band meant anything. Now I'm gonna tell you, this is toward the end, so I'm gonna tell you why postal history rocks. Uh, I looked at, when I got this collection, I, there was this piece in here, this memorial card with the three people from the same family. And I looked at it and I noticed that the deaths were like days apart. And I thought, all right, maybe too much forensic files. This sounds like an accident because as I mentioned earlier, I like disaster mail. And sure enough, I did a little sleuthing and this was not actually Missouri. 
This was an accident on the Housatonic Railway in 1865, and the people were from England, and that's what they are. They were, they were actually buried in Connecticut, which I thought was really, really interesting, and this is why I love coastal history. Lovely cover, not mine, but just gorgeous. Lastly, Mosher said that, that sending morning covers is no longer in fashion. I do have to say, in our business, I send, uh, we send condolence cards to all the families of the deceased. Uh, this one was to the collector's club to pay my dues, but I just wanted to share you a brief example of what we said. And that's it. Big thank you to Scott Tiffany and, Tiffany and the staff at the EPRL, the Friends of the British Empire, the Collectors Club of New York, of course, and Bill Johnson in the Morning Cover Society. So if you're interested in morning covers, I really suggest you join that society. It's a wealth of information. That's it. Dude, that's absolutely fabulous. Incredible. So, uh, just, you know, just absolutely astounding, uh, Joan. Thank you so much. Uh, for sharing this with us and everyone, I'm sure, uh, just just enjoyed themselves tremendously. Um, got a couple of questions, and then you know we'll wrap things up and get to our social time. But uh, are you aware of any morning covers honoring the demise of an organization, an institution, a corporation, rather than an individual? I I am not, but we could probably do a first. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's got to be some. <laughs> I haven't seen any, Larry. Um, okay. But, you know, that's not to say that, that they're not out there. There are a lot of morning covers. And I spent a lot of research going through the Dillaway stock, which was just fabulous. But I didn't, I didn't see anything about the death of an organization. A little bit about Moshe's book. When was this published? About 2003. And oh, so he, not that old. Yeah, he was a good friend of Bill's, um, who's you know who I talked to, and he he was in the exhibitor. He's in the exhibitor society, and I took over his job sending out awards. And he he was a good friend of, of Bill's, and they did a lot of stuff. So they're probably a lot more knowledgeable about morning covers than than I am. But 2003, it's a textbook. If you collect morning covers, it's a must-have. Okay, what were more? I, I noticed you you showed morning covers U.S., Canada, Europe, Latin America. You showed some to Asia. Did you see any coming out of Asia? Y yes, there there are a few coming out of Asia. I I could have bored you for another two or three hours. No, I don't the think hardest, we would be bored. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was as I looked at this. I wanted to give you a taste of all the different countries. It was so hard to pick them out. So I just thought of people and covers and pick them out. So, but yes, there's, there's practically every country and countries that are no longer existent have morning covers. So um, I actually saw one from like, I was thinking of doing ghost towns too, um, morning oh, covers that were sent to That'd be town. cute, that'd be something. And just, to clarify, I have a question. Morning covers both came to and from mourners. Well, that, that's where the definition is. And that's why I tried to emphasize that it's hard to say, yes, the morning station, that black edge station was used both to the, to the grieving family and from the grieving family. And without the content, it's really hard to know who is who. I've been dying to get a, I'd love to get the correspondence, a whole big correspondence and look through them to see, you know, to exactly see, but the chances of that are probably remote. Do you have, do you have any thoughts? I mean, by and large, um, I think in the West, the use of morning covers has by and large, can we say disappeared? Any thoughts as to why that is? Culture has changed. So the formality is, is really lacking now in, you know, in modern culture compared to bygone eras where you, want, um, you, you would want invitations to go to funerals. We also, nowadays, you have email. So a lot of people just go and post something on Facebook. So I, I mm -hmm. would expect in, two, in the 2000s, in our era, in our day, the morning covers are going to be really few and far between. Yeah. 
Um, one thing that I'd mention is a number of people have popped up in that there are instances of morning covers where the band around uh, is not in black, but is in blue. Yep. So dark color. So, and that's why it makes it very, uh, very hard to say, is it a morning cover? You know, or is it just someone used blue stationery to you know, talk about death? Or did the okay. ink just fade? Was there like a convention about how long before he said, okay, all right, stop with the morning covers. Um, he, he's gone, he's gone four years and get another box of stationery. Well, I don't think anyone would tell Queen Victoria that who used the, yeah. the morning stationery. But I, I do think there's a lot, uh, a lot to do with the paper was there, paper was expensive. And this is one of the reasons why I think that, that um, the theory that the size of the band changed throughout the morning period, it, it may not be exactly uh, spot on because, because paper was expensive and to have multiple versions. But yeah, I, I've seen a lot of the morning station are just used for regular pieces. Have you seen any morning covers that are all over black? I know they exist, I've had them. Do you have oh, those? Really? No, I, I saw them in, Okay, so I didn't want to cheat and just snip something from the internet that I didn't have, but I saw a couple of them on the internet and I was and like, wow. use white ink. Yeah, they, white, they ink. Use white ink to address them. There was a, actually I'd call it a reverse morning cover uh, in the New York theater. There was a uh, famous actor who appeared on Broadway in an opening and he got this envelope afterwards that was all uh, outlined in black and he was afraid somebody had passed away and he opened it up and it said uh you died last night <laughs> uh, that's a, that's an actual true story i just don't remember who it was about do you know any of any country that issues um postage stamps uh mainly for the use uh, on on a morning cover uh, I know that Japan uh, started to issue back in 1980s a specific uh, morning stamp uh, that you would put on a letter, uh, for example, to thank people for coming to funeral and things like that. Um, is there any other country that issues such uh, sort of morning stamp? I, I have not seen any, and I really haven't studied, you know, that era, you know, that that um, aspect of it. Again, I'm I like postal history. I like the stories, so that you know that that technical stuff. But I will make a note, and perhaps if someone else knows the answer, they they, sh they could chime in because. You know, well, I both know. both Belgium and Monaco issued morning black edged stamps. Princess Grace for Monaco and the, the Queen for Belgium. So finding those on cover should be possible. But they weren't exclusively for mourning, though, right? Not exclusively, but that's the, the, the reason that they were issued. You could use them for normal postage, but... Yeah, Bernard told me, you know, you'll see with our stuff, Bernard told me when I sent out a mourning cover, I should turn the stamp upside down. And I think that was another one of his things taking advantage of my naivete. So, anyway, Germany, Greg, you have a Germany issues uh, morning stamps to be used on uh, regular covers, oh. and they change them occasionally. I had asked the question about the uh, whether there's morning covers for institutions or other kinds of corporations, and the reason I bring it up is I do have a cover. Uh, from the very final uh, General Assembly of the League of Nations back in 1946. And it was uh, a commemorative cover somebody made, like a first day cover almost. Uh, but it is a morning cover. At least it has the black border around it uh, for the, uh, the, the, the final meeting of the League before it, it uh, was dissolved. So I guess, would that be considered a, uh, a morning cover for an institution? I guess, I mean, it, it probably could. Now, the definition, that's why I tried it up front to tell you what, how I defined a morning cover, because 
it is very hard without the contents to know what exactly, you know, what are you considering a morning cover? It, does it address death or is it just the, the black decoration? And then if it's, if it's just the black border, who's to say that, that someone just liked it? They thought it was pretty, you know, spiffy. Right, right. I guess in, in this case, it was the League of Nations was dissolved at that oh, meeting. Yeah. So perhaps they thought it was uh, the death of the organization. Do you have any covers indicating the death of a pet? Oh, no, no, I do not. You know, I've received them recently, as, as, you, as you know, we've had our share of um, pet deaths and I get them from the veterinarian, but I, I haven't seen any back in that era, but you know, that's a whole other topic on how, how the reverence of pets have evolved over the, the mm -hmm. centuries, because I, I don't think back in the 1800s, at least, pets were considered um, card worthy, so to speak. Yeah. Yes. I was thinking more of the of the mid uh, earlier mid twentieth century on those. Yeah, I think so. I know. I know. Nowadays, I always send when a friend of mine has a pet that dies. I always send a condolence card. So, and there's special cards for pet deaths. So, Thanks. I think I think that will be more of a twentieth century type thing. Yeah, late twentieth century. It's more like the late twentieth century. The whole pet parent idea. Uh, would you uh, regard out of a war zone, a letter coming announcing the death of a soldier or a family member, but the cover attached to it doesn't have a black border, but would you regard that as a mourning cover? Well, because this is my presentation, I could do whatever I want. Yes, I would. <laughs> and I did with one of the Civil War ones. I think um, those of you who are friends with Mr. Mercer would probably disagree because he defines them as having black yeah, having some sort of black on them or some sort of lines. But to me, in my presentation, my context, that is all a part about mourning, that whole notification of, of a, a death is, is really, I would include it and I did include something like that in, in my presentation. Are you familiar with photographs of the family with the coffin open, done with Lithuanian, Polish type things? I've got yes. one of my grandmother. Yeah. yeah, I saw a lot of those I, and I really was torn about putting them in. There are some photos that were quite, um, how should I put it, not appropriate for dinner, uh, yeah. a dinner show. So I did not include them. So yes, I've seen a, I've seen a lot of them and I thought it was fascinating that they'd make them postcards. Right. Oh, I, I mean, that that would be a really to me now, from my perspective, if I received a postcard like that of my aunt, I'd be a little bit freaked out. So <laughs> how early on was there a concern that the funeral home industry was taking advantage of the emotional state of the families to persuade them to pay more for the to make pay more than they really could afford? Well, that, that's a whole, I didn't touch on that. Saving up for your funeral was a really big thing. So they had funds and they had in special endowments where if you worked and they had schemes where you'd pay into it. And there, I have one postcard that I didn't show that it would tell you the people died. So that sort of decreased your, you know, the, the amount that was in this investment account. So you would sort of invest in getting your own funeral. And that, that was very, very popular back then. But there's also a big, uh, a big movement for taking care of the poor people who could not do these, uh, do these rituals. So there, I've seen correspondence or writings where families, richer families would either lend a mourner or an old mourning dress, or they would actually uh, subsidize some of the, the expense for a departed. I have one sort of really interesting Spanish American war cover. Uh, they, you see these covers a lot, red cross covers with a, um, a red crossed hand stamp on them. I have one from San Francisco uh, going into the Philippines. It has actually a black cross on it. And in the collection that I bought it in, it was described as the black cross was used for bad news. Um, 
I, I think it, generally speaking, it was considered for illnesses or deaths. And, I, I, you know, I just thought that was far and away the most unique of the many morning covers from the Spanish American War I've seen. Now, I have a couple, I, I think I have one or two from the Spanish American War. Black, you know, we could get into a whole nother dissertation on the color black for mourning, but we won't, we won't bore you. Shirley Griff is a Canadian who has exhibited mourning covers, mourning sort of paraphernalia. I know that there's an article in the Toronto Star about her collection, but it's really a fascinating exhibit because it does tie in the social aspects of it. It's been a few years since I've seen it. I don't know if she is still showing it, but uh, it might be one to, to look out for. Oh, definitely. So, you know, one of the things for me that drove this is I think social philately is going to be the way to attract more people to the hobby. So I wanted to practice what I preach. I know I'll never be a fellow in the Royal, but you know, I, at least I will have a lot, you know, I'll bring in more, I'd like to bring in more people and share that and get them to see that postal history could, could be fun and, and relate to other aspects of your life. That actually in FIP competition is a legitimate class and it's the class in which the entire Civil War exhibit that I've prepared is, is done in. So. Um, you can win major awards with that. And I think my original purpose, just like yours, was not to win awards, but to attract new people into the field and basically to show my children what I had, tell the story of the Civil War and have them say, wow, dad, that's really cool, as opposed to saying, you're a geek sitting in your, uh, in your, in your office playing with your stamps and covers. So I think you can take this. I think you could have an amazing exhibit based on the story that you just told. And I think you can win a lot of major awards with it. Now, Joan, you know what's coming up now. Yes, you're going to get a certificate and a medallion. I want, first of all, to thank you so much for putting this all together, sharing everything with us. Just fabulous and made this an absolutely stupendous evening. You get the certificate and you'll get the fully engraved uh, medal. We'll be with you shortly. So thank you again. Much, much appreciated. Your forgiveness in this letter edged in black.